And that's a lesson that stuck with me my whole life, is that when you, see, when you see yourself doing something badly and nobody's bothering to tell you anymore, that's a very bad place to be. Your critics are your ones telling you they still love you and care. Uh, after Coach Graham, I had another coach, Coach Setleff, and he taught me a lot about the power of enthusiasm. He did this one thing where only for one play at a time, he would put people in at like the most horrifically wrong position for them. Like all the short guys would become receivers, right? It was just, it was just laughable. But we only went in for one play, right? And boy, the other team just never knew what hit them. Because when, you, when you're only doing it for one play and you're just not where you're supposed to be, and freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose, boy, are you going to clean somebody's clock for that one play. <laughs> and, and that kind of enthusiasm was great. And to this day, I am most comfortable on a football field. I mean, it's, it's just one of those things where, you know, if I'm working a hard problem, people will see me wandering the halls with one of these things. And that's just because... You know, when you do something young enough and you train for it, it just becomes a part of you. And I'm very glad that football was a part of my life. And if I didn't get the dream of playing in the NFL, that's okay. I probably got stuff more valuable. Because looking at what's going on in the NFL, I'm not sure those guys are doing so great right now. <laughs> okay? And so one of the expressions I learned in electronic arts, which I love, which pertains to this, is experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. And I, I think that's absolutely lovely. Um, and the other thing about football is we send our kids out to play football or soccer or swimming or whatever it is. And it's the first example of what I'm going to call a head fake or indirect learning. We actually don't want our kids to learn football. I mean, yeah, it's really nice that I have a wonderful three-point stance and that I know how to do a chop block and all this kind of stuff. But we send our kids out to learn much more important things, teamwork, sportsmanship, perseverance, et cetera, et cetera. And these kinds of head fake learnings are absolutely important. And you should keep your eye out for them because they're everywhere. All right, a simple one, being an author in the World Book Encyclopedia. When I was a kid, we had the World Book Encyclopedia on the shelf. Uh, for the freshmen, this is paper. <laughs> we used to have these things called books. Um, and after I had become somewhat of an authority on virtual reality, but not like a really important one, so I was at the level of people the World Book would badger. Uh, they called me up and I wrote an article and uh, this is Caitlin Kelleher and uh, there's an article if you go to your local library where they still have copies of the world book, look under V for virtual reality and there it is. And all I have to say is that um, having been selected to be an author in, in the world book encyclopedia, I now believe that Wikipedia is a perfectly fine source for your information because <laughs> I know what the quality control is for real encyclopedias. They let me in. Uh, Alright, next one. Uh, <laughs> at, at a certain point, you just realize there's some things you're not going to do, so maybe you just want to stand close to the people. And, uh, uh, I mean, my God, what a, what a role model for young people. <laughs> I mean, just this is everything you want to be. And what I, what I learned that carried me forward in leadership later is that you know, he wasn't the smartest guy on the ship. I mean, Spock was pretty smart, and McCoy was the doctor, and Scotty was the engineer, and you sort of go, and what skill set did he have to get on this damn thing and run it? And, you know, clearly there's this skill set called leadership. And, you know, whether or not you like the series, there's no doubt that there was a lot to be learned about how to lead people by watching this guy in action. So, and he just had the coolest damn toys. <laughs> right? I mean, my God, he, uh... You know, I, I just thought it was fascinating as a kid that he had this thing and he could, you know, talk to the ship with it. Right? <laughs> you know, I, I just thought that was just spectacular. And of course, now I own one and it's smaller. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. Uh, so I got to achieve this dream. Uh, James T. Kirk, his alter ego. Um, uh, William Shatner wrote a book, which I think was actually a pretty cool book. Uh, it was with uh, Chip Walter, who is uh, a, a Pittsburgh-based author who's quite good. And they wrote a book on basically the science of Star Trek, you know, what has come true. And they went around to top places around the country and looked at various things, and they came here to study our virtual reality setup. And uh, so we built a virtual reality for him. It looked something like that. Um, we put it in, put it to red alert. He was a very good sport. It's not like he saw that one coming. <laughs> And it's really cool to meet your boyhood idol. 
But it's even cooler when he comes to you to see what cool stuff you're doing in your lab. <laughs> and that was, that was just a great moment. All right, winning stuffed animals. Uh, this may seem mundane to you, but when you're a little kid and you see the big buff guys walking around in the amusement park and they got all these big stuffed animals, right? And uh, this is my lovely wife. And uh, I have a lot of pictures of stuffed animals I've won. <laughs> That's my dad posing with one that I won. Uh, I've won a lot of these animals. <laughs> There's my dad. He did win that one, to his credit. Um, <laughs> right? And, and this was just a big part of my life and my family's life. But, you know, I can hear the cynics. You know, in this age of digitally manipulated things, Maybe those bears really aren't in the picture with me. <laughs> or maybe I paid somebody five bucks to take a picture in the theme park next to the bear. And I said, how in this age of cynicism can I convince people? And I said, I know. I can show them the bears. Bring them out. <laughs> just put them right there. We just put them back against the wall. Yes, me. Okay. Thanks, honey. <laughs> uh, so uh, here's some here's some bears. Uh, we didn't have quite enough room in the moving truck down to Chesapeake, and uh, you know, anybody who'd like a little piece of me uh, at the end of this, uh, feel free to come up. First come, first serve. <laughs> All right, my next one: being an Imagineer. This was the hard one. Uh, believe me, getting to zero gravity is easier than becoming an Imagineer. Uh, when I was a kid, I was eight years old, and our family took a trip cross-country to see Disneyland. And if you've ever seen the movie National Lampoon's Vacation, it was a lot like that. <laughs> it was a quest. And uh, these are real vintage photographs. Uh, and there I am in front of the castle. And there I am. And for those of you who are into foreshadowing, this is the Alice ride. <laughs> and, and I just thought this was just the coolest, coolest environment I'd ever been in. And instead of saying, gee, I want to experience this, I said, I want to make stuff like this. And so I, I bided my time. And then I graduated with my PhD from Carnegie Mellon, thinking that meant me infinitely qualified to do anything. And I dashed off my letters of application to Walt Disney Imagineering. And they sent me some of the damn nicest go to hell letters I've ever gotten. Uh, I mean, it was just, uh, we have carefully reviewed your application. And presently, we do not have any positions available which require your particular qualifications. <laughs> Now think about the fact that you're getting this from a place that's famous for guys who sweep the street, right? <laughs> so that was a bit of a setback. But remember, the brick walls are there for a reason, right? The brick walls are not there to keep us out. The brick walls are there to give us a chance to show how badly we want something. Because the brick walls are there to stop the people who don't want it badly enough. They're there to stop the other people. <laughs> All right, fast forward to 1991. We did a system back at the University of Virginia called Virtual Reality on $5 a day. Uh, just one of those unbelievable, spectacular things. I was so scared back in those days as a junior academic. Uh, Jim Foley's here, and I just love to tell this story. Uh, he knew my undergraduate advisor, uh, Andy Van Dam, and I'm at my first conference, and I'm just scared to death. And this, this icon in the user interface community walks up to me and just out of nowhere just gives me this huge bear hug, and he says, that was from Andy. <laughs> And that was when I thought, OK, maybe I can make it. Right? You know, maybe, maybe I do belong. Uh, and a similar story is that this was just this unbelievable hit, because at the time, everybody needed a half a million dollars to do virtual reality. And everybody felt frustrated. And we literally hacked together a system for about $5,000 in parts and made a working VR system. And people were just like, oh my god, it's like you know, the Hewlett Packard garage thing. This is so awesome. And so I'm giving this talk, and the room has just gone wild. And during the Q&A, a guy named Tom Furness, who was one of the big names in virtual reality at the time, he goes up to the microphone and he introduces himself. And I didn't know what he looked like, but I sure as hell knew the name. And he, and he asked a question. And I was like, I'm sorry, did you say you're Tom Furness? <laughs> he said, yes. I said, then I would love to answer your question. But first, will you have lunch with me tomorrow? <laughs> And, and there's a lot in that little moment, right? There's a lot of humility, but also asking a person where he can't possibly say no. 